Hi, I'm Hull History Nerd. On this episode of the History of Cottingham, we're going to be taking a look at Cottingham's biggest and oldest church, St Mary's. St Mary the Virgin Church in Cottingham has been a landmark in the area for hundreds of years. The centre of the parish of Cottingham, which was quite a size, but also the only part of Cottingham that's visible from afar, with the distinctive pinnacle tower being visible poking above the leafy canopy of the surrounding trees for miles around, whether you're at the top of Hull Royal Infirmary or the, some of the tower blocks or on the upper floors of the University Library. I can see my house from here. Interestingly, those pinnacles are actually one of the later additions to the church being installed in 1744. But St Mary's has an identity problem. It's not as large or as ornate as the ones in larger local towns, such as Beverley or Hedden, but it's far larger and more ornate than those you find in other small villages nearby, such as those at Skidby or Little Wheaton. Rather like Cottingham itself, it's not sure whether it wants to be the church of a small town or the church of a large village. Many people are surprised to learn that St Mary's is around the same age as Hull's Holy Trinity Church, now Hull Minster. Much of this surprise is because Holy Trinity has a lot of brick construction, which people often think is a sign that a building is much newer than a similar building made of cut stone. But Hull was quite pioneering in its use of brick. There was a sizeable brickworks just outside the north gate of the town, owned by the Delapole brothers, and given the cost of shipping in stone from elsewhere, it was deemed much cheaper and easier to build in brick. Cottingham, however, wasn't a new merchant town like Hull. It was in the possession of a lord rather than being a king's town, and no expense was spared in making Cottingham's church look and feel the part. The stone was shipped in on river boats, presumably from the West Riding, and masons made sure that the church was suitably embellished. Now with most medieval churches, because they're big things, they were often built in stages where a church would be built to a certain size, but then it would have bits added to it as time went on. And because of this, and because of the gaps between these building processes, you would end up with a building that reflect several different architectural styles in a kind of strange collage. And St Mary's is no different. But to understand the differences between those, we need to look at the architectural styles of the Middle Ages in church building. Now, around the kind of 13th, 14th century, there was a new wave of church building that was emanating from Europe. And this was known as the Gothic. Prior to the Gothic in England, churches had been built in the Saxon or Norman styles. And these churches were squat, sort of short, stocky affairs with small towers, tiny windows and lots of internal walls that would separate out the different parts of the church building. And what this meant was that inside they were actually quite small and fairly dark. But the Gothic embraced light as a representation of God and also they wanted to design churches to have this sense of divine awe in the congregation. And space was a big part of that. So the internal walls that made everything feel so small inside had to go. So the early Gothic churches in England had pillars inside to remove this separation of the different parts. So it comes like a, an open plan church design. And likewise, to let the light in, bigger windows were of the order of the day. Now, this didn't come without architectural challenges. If you increase the size of a window in a building with big supporting walls, you inevitably weaken the big supporting walls. And through a process of trial and error, 
it was realized that churches were going to need extra reinforcement and hence these things buttresses sticking out from the walls at right angles they acted almost like pillars built into the walls supporting a huge chunk of the weight of the roof now some churches not st mary's it has quite a, a modest timber roof but some of the churches from the high gothic period actually had huge heavy stone vaulted ceilings which were incredibly heavy and really really difficult for um, these thin walls to take and the buttresses were increasingly necessary and one thing that does happen particularly with the gothic period is as time rolls on you tend to find some of these features getting more and more exaggerated in the middle gothic period known as the decorated period for instance the windows got bigger and more delicate more refined tracery was added to the top and this is the period when st mary's earliest modern parts were actually built the nave and the transepts so you find that the decorated features the the tracery in the windows is a big thing and of course if you widen the windows you weaken the walls which means you have to make more buttresses and so that becomes a feature and a staple of decorated um, architecture the decorated style on churches and you can see this very very heavily in places like Beverly Minster and those buttresses would in some churches get even more ornate as time went on sometimes even separating out from the church so you could walk in between the church and the buttress known as flying buttresses but St Mary's doesn't have anything quite so dramatic now as I mentioned earlier St Mary's church was built initially in the 1320s at least the nave and the um, transepts were built in the 1320s so they fully embrace this early decorated period so you can see this marvelous tracery in the windows the big windows but not as big as they would become in the perpendicular period which was the last stage of the gothic style in England and these styles didn't have sharp periods where one ended and one begun it was more a kind of they just smushed into each other somewhere in the middle as one style gradually merged into the next and the perpendicular style was noted for having enormous windows but also and this is why it's called perpendicular it was a huge fan of giant long straight lines heading straight up to heaven the tower became an important part of perpendicular churches but we can see what happened to windows here in the chancel at St Mary's because this was built in the 1340s 20 years after the rest of those parts of the church and then straight away you can see the size of those windows is way bigger and especially the one at the very end of the building far larger than anything in the nave and transept but in the 1400s the ultimate piece of perpendicular style was added to the church whatever tower it had had before was replaced by this and straight away you can see the influence what I was saying about those lines heading straight to heaven the big tall windows in the bell tower the big buttresses that support it all the way up it grabs the eye from afar it has this this arm reaching out to heaven kind of feel about it and it adds that sense of divine awe that was the whole purpose of the gothic style of church development in the first place Before the 1880s, Cottingham was a huge parish that covered Skidby to the west and came as far east as the River Hull at the hamlets of Newland and Hull Bank. While Skidby technically had its own church and parish, it was overseen by the rectors of Cottingham all the way up to the mid-19th century. But the other far-flung hamlets had very little in terms of places of worship apart from perhaps a small chapel at Newland. And we have to remember that churches were very much the hub of a community in the days before industrialisation. Old country lanes, still remembered in Cottingham's layout today as Snicket's, led to Newland and Hull Bank, providing easy access to St Mary's for worship, weddings, births and funerals, as well as Cottingham's market. It would have been the hub of the parish, the centre of village life. All roads led here, from Holgate to Church Lane, to the road to Hull Bank that's immortalised as the snicket known as Boardside Walk, Snuff Mill Lane which carries on across from Holgate towards Newland, 
It also survived the Reformation largely unmolested, probably because Henry VIII knew the local lord. Unlike many other churches, which were sacked and vandalised, frescoes being painted over as at Pickering, and idols and shrines being smashed. It participated in various exercises to help the poor throughout the ages, including putting aside land in the 1820s for the founding of the Pauper's Village on the corner of what was then called In Common Lane, later New Village Road, which was land and cottages set aside for poor folk so they could grow their own crops and have some way to try and eke a living. Though it should be said, New Village was the brainchild of a Wesleyan, Thomas Thompson, the parish did set aside the land for the development. But all of this couldn't last. In the 1880s, the parish was much reduced, with nearby Kingston-upon-Hull absorbing the hamlets of Newland and Hull Bank and swarming around them with industrial and residential development, reducing Cottingham's parish to pretty much the size it is to this day. As secularism increased and religious beliefs fragmented into a number of different variations of the same faith, St Mary's was no longer the only church in the village anymore. The Zion reformists built a church on Holgate in 1819 and that replaced their earlier chapel in the village. The primitive Methodists had their own chapel on King Street from the 1860s, which can still be seen even though they united with the other Zionists in the 1930s. The other Methodists built their own rather grand church on Holgate in the 1870s and the Catholics had Holy Cross Church built in 1928 at the end of Carrington Avenue. As the 20th century rolled on and an increasing proportion of people left religion behind, St Mary's played a decreasing role in the social life of the village and the parish. But aside from increasing secularisation and the fragmentation of Christian faiths, the Industrial Revolution had another rather unpleasant surprise in store for St Mary's. Sadly, being built of a fairly soft rock meant that she was very vulnerable to the acidification of rain. All those coal belching smokestacks of industrial hull and indeed industrial Europe had their effect. All those particles of sulphur dioxide in the atmosphere merged with other particles and increased the pH factor, the acidity of the water vapour that was falling as rain. And even now, she still bears a lot of the scars of this acid rain and indeed many of the, uh, the tombstones around the churchyard. But despite all of these problems, St Mary's, even today in the 21st century, sits at the heart of Cottingham's community, whether it's through child groups or through fundraising or the bell ringing. It's still reassuring to know that this gentle giant sits here in the middle of the village, soaking up the sun's rays just as it has done for 600 years or so. And for me personally, I'm no believer, not in any stretch of the imagination, but it brings me great joy to know that this piece of living history still stands because it's a window to a time that's almost alien to us, a time when an entire culture completely believed in the literal truth of the Christian story and they sought to capture that sense of divine awe in their buildings and in their art and sometimes where those two things collided in churches and cathedrals. These things are places of Magic, in a sense, that this is where the human imagination was allowed to be writ large in stone and glass. And long may St Mary's continue to stand watch over coming generations of the people of Cottingham.